We have to close down our government. We're building that wall. I don't believe that any president has accomplished as much as this president in the first six or seven months. I really don't believe. Just a sample there of the highlights of the speech. So for more, joining us now are Democratic strategist Caroline Heldman and CNN political commentators, dramatic Democratic strategist Dave Jacobson and Republican consultant John Thomas. Also with us, Republican strategist Austin James, Cypress College political science professor Peter Matthews and in Phoenix, CNN's Miguel Marquez. So I want to go to uh, Peter first. What's going on here with this president? Because at times he seemed angry, uh, agitated. There was some bizarre and, and, you know, some blatantly incorrect statements which he kept making over and over again. It's unbelievable. Actually, he's facing a crisis of legitimacy, as we call in political science and sociology. Legitimacy is the authority to use power because of rightness, because of being right in doing so. It means people acknowledge your power, your decision-making, and they trust you with what you're doing. But in this case, this president's been all over the place. He says one thing one day, the opposite the next day. And to actually come out with falsehoods when he says, for example, that he will make sure that the, uh, the reform in Obamacare would include uh, pre-existing conditions, and when he proposes it, it doesn't include it. So many contradictions, and people are wondering, can he even handle foreign policy with North Korea, for example, where he pushes the country to the brink rather than negotiating? Uh, there's a lot of question of legitimacy here, and it's just an example of his position of lack of legitimacy in the eyes of the majority of American voters, apparently, especially according to the polls right now. Like CNN, CNN does not want its falling viewership to watch what I'm saying tonight, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, Austin, he was, yeah. he was accusing hits. us of not broadcasting his And you know where I saw that? On CNN. Yeah. Yeah. Was wall wall. I mean, this, yeah. this was a, this, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. I, okay, listen, I mean. This is a little divorced from reality sure, at the very least. Sure, but I mean, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you can kind of put your finger in the air and see where the wind's blowing. Uh, look at the people behind him. I mean, as soon as he drops these one-liners, the people erupted. P people I mean, like he was playing to his crowd. The, the, he wasn't having an intellectual the only, debate. Me, and I think we need to be clear about that. May I say yeah. something? Go, the only yeah, problem absolutely. is the people behind him represent 33% of the population, the voting population. His numbers have dropped tremendously from when he got elected. His approval rating is way down in all the polls. It doesn't matter if it's a poll that's sampling voters or sampling general public. So he's going, those people behind him may be his loyal supporters, but he cannot win re-election with them. That needs to become more legitimate with other people, with the rest of America, by reaching out to people and using some of the tradition and charisma and legality, which most people are legitimate actually rely on as, as well, leaders of the country. Well, well, Peter, I want to stay with you because I, I, I want all of us to take a listen to something else the president had to say about the media because he did go on about the media mm -hmm. a lot. for well over 20 yeah. minutes, let's be clear. Um, because he didn't just say the media, he didn't say we are just bad people. He took it a step further. Take a listen. For the most part, honestly, these are really, really dishonest people and they're bad people. And I really think they don't like our country. I really believe that. Peter, the president of the United States saying the media doesn't like this country. He really does believe that. A free media is one of the pillars of American democracy. democracy. Uh, I mean, what, democracy, what's his end game here? It is very dangerous because now he's vilifying the character of a major institution that's important for democracy as a mediating influence. Uh, and he's, he's just ca calling them basically calling them evil. He could use the word evil and saying they're bad people. You don't negotiate with bad people or with evil. And that is very dangerous. He's vilifying his anyone who doesn't agree with him as being anti-American. And that is going back to not just McCarthyism, but perhaps worse even toward fascism or something like in what's, what was going on in Germany before Hitler or when he came to power, as he was coming to power. So something you have to really watch out for. I opinion. know you want to respond to that. I just want to get this one um, response that we had from the former uh, director of yeah. national intelligence, James Clutter, because a lot of people mm -hmm. out there are now questioning this president's um, fitness for office. Mm -hmm. Clapper took it one step further. Is he a threat to national security, the president? Well, he certainly could be. Uh, again, um, having some understanding of, of the, uh, the levers that a president can exercise, um, I worry about, frankly, uh, uh, you know, the uh, access to nuclear codes. Uh, if he, in a fit of pique, uh, he decides to uh, do something about Kim Jong-un, uh, there's actually very little uh, to, to stop him.
Uh, Caroline, when James Clapper is worried about the president having access to the nuclear code, should we all be worried about the president having the access to the nuclear codes? Yes, and I think many of us are. And I think it's time for the Republicans to step up and put their country before their party. Uh, it is time to look at what 40% of Americans want, which is impeachment. It is time to look at the possibility that his fitness might be compromised by mental health issues or cognitive issues. I mean, this is a man who couldn't find his limo coming off a plane. This is a man who didn't know where he was in in the middle of a presser with Netanyahu. Um, this is a man, anytime he's not on script, sounds like a, a rambling person, a rambling press conference. Yeah, let, me, let me talk Seconds, about Peter, national security. Just, just a minute, please. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Clapper's statement is very important because think of what he did with Kim Jong-un in the middle of this crisis where he keeps escalating and brinkmanship. For example, when Kim Jong-un said, we're not going to fire those four missiles at Guam, the president should, any, should have actually said, we're going to take a step also to back down a bit to give a confidence-building measure a chance to survive and work. That's how you negotiate. That's what I'm really concerned about, that uh, Mr. Clapper's statement was absolutely correct, that this president may not know how to negotiate, may not know the history of North Korea, U.S. relations, the fact that we've never signed a peace treaty with them. All of these things have to be brought, and this president does not have the details of history or diplomacy or the judgment sometimes to reciprocate and be able to keep things under control in a crisis. I want to bring Peter in because, Peter, smart politics doesn't actually mean it's smart policy or it's actually good for the country. That's correct. Uh, public policy has to be public interest. It has to serve the whole country. And Trump is not doing that. He's looking at a very narrow slice of the pie, which he wants to retain just to hopefully win back and keep the Senate and the House in his hands. It has to do with Congress as well. They're the, the election they're up for in 2018. And if he's only considered himself uh, to be a politician, but not a leader, not a statesperson, not someone who wants to lead this country in the right direction, he will not be successful and neither will the Congress itself which is at lowest popularity ratings right now, especially the Republicans in Congress. So this has to be turned around. It's not good policy. Uh, politics that may be good for him to get possibly reelected, which I don't think he will, is not good policy in terms of public interest. And that's what we have to look for. How does the stock market react? How does the global economy react to all, if there is, in fact, a government shutdown? Well, they won't react very well at all. But I'd like to make a point about policy, two policy points. One is the, if you look at the fact that Donald Trump won the electoral votes, but he also lost the popular vote by three million, he did it because the Macomb County, Michigan voters, who voted for Barack Obama, by the way, in 2008 and 2012, they voted for Donald Trump because they lost manufacturing jobs. They were not replaced by retraining for new jobs. Trump is not addressing that part of it. And the wall, he talks about shutting off the illegal immigration. The folks that come from south of the border don't come here for the good food or the good weather that we have, which we do. They come here because they're looking for work. And NAFTA and free trade has been a major problem. And the neglect of working class people. And so I think he needs to put this together. Trump needs to look at the overall picture and stop scapegoating and blaming one portion of the population or this or that and neglecting the real voters. So I think it would be a terrible thing to shut down the government. At the same time, he's got to address some real underlying causes of our problems right now, which he's not doing very well in my view. Okay. Well, welcome back, everyone. We're live on the West Coast, and our panel is still with us. Uh, I want to go straight to Peter Matthews, here, who is our political science buff. Peter, straight to you. You heard what the president said. No president has accomplished as much as he has. You're the one with all the history facts. Is he telling the truth? Absolutely not. I mean, he can think that or dream it, but if you look at other presidents who have accomplished some real... You know, his, not a significant piece of legislation was passed or signed by Congress or signed by him, in these last six months, mostly executive orders, which were just miniature, minor, minor things to do. And he was not able to get anything through Congress. And we need action right now with the economy. We need action with education, with health care. And he has, he's failed in all those accounts, unfortunately, for him, but also for the United States, for the American people. So I would say okay. he's exaggerating considerably. And Peter, to you, you know, to be fair, apparently that report came out you know, before Donald Trump you know, talked about respect, you know, Kim Jong-un's respect to him. But do you believe that in some ways maybe the bellicose language that we did hear from Donald Trump when it came to North Korea, has it actually worked in this one instance? I say it hasn't worked because North Korea is going full force forward and getting those rocket engines. And it has to go back to what Trump doesn't understand. And that is that what has happened with North Korea is they're concerned about getting uh, regime change like Iraq was. And they want to make sure that that won't happen to them. And I think Donald Trump needs to be able to negotiate with them like the agreed framework under which Bill Clinton actually agreed for eight or ten years kept the negotiations going and agreed to give them fuel and build light water re nuclear reactors in exchange for them shutting out heavy water reactors and not building any bombs. And for 10 years it worked that way until that was changed when George Bush came in. And Donald Trump needs to know the history of that and go back to that and agree 
to maybe do some confidence building. Let's say we won't uh, continue these uh, war games every year. We'll hold back this year. Since North Korea agreed not to attack the, uh, the uh, Guam, we'll hold back on the war games in order to, to build confidence building measures and negotiate that way. And I think instead, Donald Trump is being more brinkmanship and belligerent, and it's going to cause, it could be a miscalculation, and we know what could happen with miscalculation. World War I was started that way. So I think that he has to really change his ways on that. Joining us here now in Los Angeles, Peter Matthews, political science professor at Cypress College. Uh, Peter, good to see you. Good to be here. Uh, this visit by Pence, it really was straight out of politics 101. How to visit a disaster zone, you meet the survivors, you hug them, you, you pray with them, you don't brag about the crowd size, um, you know, and then you move on. Um, it's a fine line, though, for Mike Pence, because he's always so cautious not to upstage his boss, president. Donald Trump. Right. And it's the natural thing to do. Pence is a natural politician, and he felt he had to rush to t t t touch the people. And he hugged them, and he, his wife, Karen, prayed with them. And that's what should be done, really. It should be done naturally, not in a forced way. And you're right, he was worried about maybe he looks better than the president. Uh, I did notice that almost every single time he, he said anything, it was like, and as the president has said, and as yes. Donald Trump has promised. I mean, he, so he's really mindful of this. Mindful and deferring to the president, which becomes a bit awkward sometimes, yeah, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Especially given the, the visit on Tuesday by the president. By the which, president, who was mostly in his limousine. Yeah. He didn't stop and meet the people. He said he didn't want to upstage the, the reconstruction effort, but you could meet people and see, well, how are you doing? Exactly. These are our fellow human beings, fellow Americans. So. Well, to, you know, to his credit, the president has promised a donation of a million dollars out of his own pocket from his own money. Um, it's certainly a, a, it's no small gesture, but there are questions about you know, Donald Trump following through in the past when he's offered to make, when he's offered to make, uh, to make a donation yeah. and, and maybe hasn't followed through. Um, but at the also, same, it's a very small amount compared well, to the billion it's it, going to cost. He, yeah, he described it as a small loan at one stage, you know, back in the <laughs> right. political campaign. Um, at the same time, though, Donald Trump has proposed a budget which would slash the funding for almost every government agency which is working in Texas right now to help the people impacted by this storm. So a million dollar personal donation, that's great. But these people, in many ways, would be helped a, a lot more if that budget was, wasn't cut, but possibly increased. That's right. And there's a difference between a, a commitment on a collective level that society should make by passing a law and saying, here's the money from the taxpayer, because we're all in this together. And the other one is, let's just do it voluntarily and give what we can and only what will work, possibly for some people, a few people. It's a completely wrong way to go about it, in my view. But, but this, this is basically a different sort of in ideological beliefs in many ways. This sort of it is a belief system all down. So, so, you know, from what, what we've seen over, over time, um, which one works better, leaving it up to individuals to show generosity or basically having the government do it? I mean, it's pretty you've obvious. Got answer, to, it? You've got to have the foundation of the yeah. government doing it, and then you can also allow people to be generous individually if they want to. But there's nothing that can replace a collective effort of society to care about the public interest. I mean, look at this. When there are disasters, when the first, 1950, the first disaster struck when the federal government was authorized to get involved, it was because individuals cannot do it and afford to do it on their own. In 1974, when President uh, Nixon expanded the, the Federal Relief Disaster Relief Act, yeah. He put more money into it, got more agencies involved, and then President Carter brought about FEMA to centralize it. So again, it was government action, but also personal uh, involvement and personal donation of time, at least. Okay. Well, at the same time as all this is happening in Texas, the special counsel, Robert Mueller, continues on with the investigation into the alleged ties between the Trump campaign and the Kremlin. And what, we see, what we're seeing here now is this increasing focus on Paul Manafort, yes. Trump's campaign manager, you know, for a time. And the New York Attorney General now is also involved in this investigation, focusing on Manafort. That is significant for a lot of reasons beyond Paul Manafort, right? Very significant because at the federal level, any kind of federal offense that the president's prosecuted for or accused of, can, he could pardon himself or pardon anyone else who's accused of a federal crime. But a state accusation, a state prosecution, does not allow the president to give uh, clemency or uh, pardoning anyone regarding that. So that means that way the prosecutor, the investigators can actually investigate and get people to, to go and collaborate. At this, if it's a state type of investigation, which is what they're doing right now. Because the theory always was that uh, the president uh, pardoned Sheriff Jaya, Joe Apayo, um, or this is a signal to anybody being questioned or pursued by Mueller, I've got your back, don't cooperate. If, if you get convicted, I'll pardon you. Yeah. So this sort of negates that? It does. Uh, the signal was there, but I'm not sure Mr. Trump even understood what he was doing because this does negate it. If you get the state level involved, and Schneiderman has a history of, of going after Trump and trying to find out what was done in malfeasance yeah, for the it, president even early on. He has been after Trump for a long time. A long Is time. there a downside uh, to that or an upside of that for the president? He can point to that and say, look, look, he's going after me. This is all politically motivated. He can say that, but will people believe it? The evidence has to be there. And if Schneiderman pro pro provides evidence that he needs to investigate this, including Manafort, and his follow the money type investigation. You don't forget, he's, he's hired a lot of people who have expertise in money laundering and other kinds of things that are, that are financial crimes. Yeah. So this is very important that uh, Comey is not, I mean that um, 
Uh, Paul Manafort is going to be investigated for that reason by Schneiderman, but also by Mueller. Okay. Very uh, important. Peter, good to see you. Thanks, good thanks to, for the insight. Good Appreciate to be here again, John. The United States condemns this terror attack, and we will do whatever is necessary to help. Joining me now, political analyst Peter Matthews. And of course, Peter, as with Donald Trump, it's not necessarily the initial response, but there is always a controversy somewhere. A lot of people have noted that the president was very quick to condemn the terrorist attack in Barcelona, yet he is still uh, to call a similar attack, a car attack in Charlottesville, Virginia, an act of domestic terrorism. He said, call it whatever you want. So can you explain why Donald Trump sees these two attacks, which seem very different to most, as being so different to him? A complete double standard on his part. Not only did he condemn decisively the terrorist attack in Spain, he even sent love, as his tweet indicated, to the Spaniards. But in, when it came to Charlottesville, there wasn't a word about terrorism in any way, and I think he's playing to his base. He wants that extremist base of his, a portion that's extremist, the white nationalists, white supremacists, to stick with him and vote for him and, and get people galvanized once again in 2020 if he can. He's always catered to his base, and overall his base supports just 33 percent, 34 percent. But he was thinking politically, but also from his emotional basis. He just doesn't seem to be able to connect with the, the tragedy of this kind of thing in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Charlottesville because the people who were the counter-protesters didn't agree with him politically. Mm. And he took one side over the other. It was completely egregious as an American president. It never happened before in my, my view, in my lifetime. Right. Well, with, with Charlottesville, the president, he was, he was criticized for that tepid initial response on Saturday. Uh, by Tuesday at that very kind of contentious news conference, he said that first response about Charlottesville, he was just being cautious. This is what he said. You don't make statements that direct unless you know the fact. It takes a little while to get the facts. You still don't know the facts. And it's a very, very uh, important process to me. There does seem to be a trend here when it comes to the president wanting to be cautious and when he wants to be quick off the mark. Yeah, like the double standard. Uh, he wants to not wait for facts when the event, events occurred in Florida and he right away jumped to the conclusion that it was a terrorist, a Muslim terrorist. And when it comes to this, he's going to wait for the facts because he doesn't want to take a decisive stand against white supremacy and the terrorism of that group that was there on Friday night and Saturday night again. Uh, causing violence, armed, and then someone ramming, one, one their members ramming an automobile into the body of many, many people, uh, you know, killing one woman, a beautiful 32-year-old woman who's an activist, social justice activist, Heather Meyer, uh, was killed dead, and, and it was horrible. She, she was a person exemplary and a, and a per perfect example, a fine uh, example of what America is all, it should be about, and most of us are about. In this case, the president has to get this right. In fact, Senator Bob Corker says he doesn't think the president has the competence or the ability to be successful at this point. He hasn't yeah, shown it. Uh, study what General Pershing of the United States did to terrorists when caught. There was no more radical Islamic terror for 35 years. Now, this is a golden oldie statement from the campaign. This was Donald Trump last year explaining what he meant. He caught 50 terrorists who did tremendous damage and killed many people. And he took the 50 terrorists and he took 50 men and he dipped 50 bullets in pig's blood. And he had his men load his rifles and he lined up the 50 people and they shot 49 of those people. And the 50th person, he said, you go back to your people and you tell them what happened. And for 25 years, there wasn't a problem. Okay, so the story changes a little bit, but the, the bottom line is none of it is true. And you know, during the campaign, that was pointed out to the president. So why would he so publicly you know, put a, a rumor out there or a false debunked story, not only proven uh, to be wrong, but also offensive? Because Donald Trump has never had a problem with lying or coming out with facts that don't exist. He talks about fake news. He is the fake news in many ways. And he doesn't, no compunction about that, no worry about that. He just wants to say things that he wants to say to get his base fired up. And get people who are, you know, full of his particular ideology out there and supporting him once again. So that's one reason he didn't care about it and brought it back up again. The same comments of the general Pershing, totally inaccurate. And, and very quickly, there doesn't seem to be um, any realization from from the president of essentially the, the controversy over his actions over the last couple of days. There's no moderation of his behavior. I guess that was not to be expected. Isn't it amazing? I mean, we have, every time we think that we're at the apex of this crisis of leadership, 
it gets even worse. And so I'm not surprised one bit as to how he sees this. He's not, he's not really connected to reality fully, in my view. And we need the president to be so. As Senator Corker said, we need him to succeed. But he hasn't shown one iota of the possibility of being a successful leader who can take this country forward in the right way. Mark, thank you. Congressional and FBI investigations, White House confusion, Russia, and alleged memos that have critics calling for the possible impeachment of a president. It's a daily, if not hourly, stress on Americans watching this play out in real time. Political analyst uh, Peter Matthews is a professor of political science and sociology at Cypress College and the author of the book Dollar Democracy with Liberty and Justice for Some. How to reclaim the American dream for all. Welcome back. Good yeah, to good see morning. You. Good to see you, Frank so, and Jessica. This this daily barrage. I mean, I think it affects everybody in some way. I would just say most Americans are con are very content with their personal lives. They like to have friends, family, go out for you know on a vacation. But this thing is that it's from the outside is coming in and impinging on their personal lives and shaking things up, mm -hmm. and people are very unsettled right now. Lots of folks. And even under Nixon's Watergate situation, it wasn't like this. Hmm. Not in the first 100 days of the presidency. This yeah. is the 415th mm -hmm. day, and we've got this already. Right. It's quite amazing. So more on that. Many critics want to compare President Trump to former President Richard Nixon. But you say Nixon's presidency and voter approval are actually quite different. From quite different. Nixon's voter approval was 62% at this time in his presidency. Obama's was 65%. Trump's at 40%. It's quite a bit of difference. And also, the Watergate affair didn't occur the, after the fourth year of the presidency. This is happening the first, the 115th day and less than that, you know. Yeah. So it's very different. People are concerned about what the uncertainty, the fact that you really can't trust what this president is saying fully because he changes his mind and a lot of investigations going on distracting him from his main platform that he wants to accomplish. But you say some people are not. A few attention. people, I can imagine, there's probably the young people who haven't gone to college. Because I can tell you from my students in college, mm. they're very aware of this and very concerned what this could mean for their future and their job prospects and other things. So maybe the students or the young people who haven't gone to college or are working very hard trying to make ends meet, uh, they're focused on that mostly. There may be an outside noise for them. It's not really directly uh, involving their lives. Mm. Now, critics are calling for the impeachment uh, of a president, of our president, and, and to do so, actually, there's very specific and high standards of proof. What, what would they be? What are they? One of them is obstruction of justice, and it just says formally in the Constitution, uh, treason, bribery, or high crimes or misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. The misdemeanor part can be interpreted by Congress to mean almost anything. Even a dereliction of duty, for example, that's a loose interpretation, and Congress can pretty much use whatever reason they want to vote for articles of impeachment. But I would say the most possibility is obstruction of justice if this Comey memo blows up even further. Because, you know, uh, FBI Director Comey has written a memo uh, when he met with the president uh, claiming, allegedly, mm -hmm. that President uh, Trump asked him to drop the investigation against Michael Flynn. That could be construed if it's true. We don't know yet as obstruction of justice. So there may be grounds for impeachment there. But again, it's what Congress wants to define as impeachable, pretty mm. much. Yes. If that happens, what would be the procedure? The House would actually vote for articles of impeachment by specifying what the basis of it is. Once they vote for it, then it goes to the Senate for trial. So impeachment itself is not the removal of the president. The removal occurs after the impeachment in the Senate, actually. That's how it works. We only had two presidents impeached in our history, President Bill Clinton and President Andrew Johnson in the Civil War, and they were never removed. Mm -hmm. So this is far more serious, and we'll have to see what happens now. I appreciate you being here this morning. For more information about political analysts and Professor Peter Matthews, you can check out his website. You can also follow him on social media. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. We need a single-payer system, much more like the other countries that have half the cost of health care per person than we do, and yet you have them, uh, Obama and, and both Trump tinkering around the edges here while the costs of health care go up in tremendous amounts of money, like as he pointed out. So you're going to have to have a much more efficient way of delivering the health care on a non-profit basis. Our, our neighbor Canada does it very well, actually, but I don't see too many health insurance companies that will support that. Vermont already reject, hmm. Vermont rejected it because it was too expensive, and the Colorado voters just defeated single payer. Anybody who thinks that the government can deliver better coverage at a lower cost is absolutely nuts. We do it in Medicare for the elderly right here. I would disagree. And that's what the we're hearing. <laughs> yeah, Medicare we have here. There's a very small window uh, of time for them to reach agreement on this. Something that was interesting that he mentioned um, in his speech was um, something new, and that was voice, the victim of immigration crime engagement, that um, he's ordered the Department of Homeland Security to create an office to serve American victims, and that office is called voice, which is what I just mentioned. Peter, does it light another fire? Absolutely, yes. 
And I think it's a very bad situation for Trump in that sense. He's got to unite the people and not divide them with these policies and proposals. The real problem with this immigration is that, once again, undocumented folks don't come here for the weather or for the great food that we have, which we do. They could stay in Mexico on the parts, but they come here for the jobs. And that's because of free trade and NAFTA, as Bill Clinton pushed through with Republicans, bipartisan support for free trade, not fair trade. Not higher wages, not higher environmental standards, which we should have. And Trump should be talking about that. Political analyst Peter Matthews is a professor of political science and sociology at Cypress College. He joins us with his insights about who won and lost points during yesterday's testimony. Welcome back. Uh, first, uh, James Comey, what worked best for him in his testimony and why? He came across as a person with integrity whose only concern was to protect the investigation in terms of the possible Russian collusion. So that came across very strongly, mm. and that meant that lowered the credibility of the president at the same time. Uh, so I would say that uh, the winners of this, the, the testimony was Comey, uh, Kamala Harris, and the FBI. Mm. But there was so much on, uh, yeah. just to follow up, yeah. the, the idea that Comey uh, leaked the memo the, uh, of the events. Now, he did leak it after he left office, but that's, that's become a talking point for Republicans. Right, and other people have said that it wasn't really a leak. It was basically had to do with an unclassified uh, opinion that he had and that he got to the news media because he wanted to be able to solicit having a special prosecutor, a special counsel to be brought in. So yeah, that's been accused of being a leak, but other people see it more as an unclassified sharing of a memo with, with the news media, so something else could be achieved. You uh, brought up Kamala Harris, senator uh, from California. Mm -hmm. uh, really uh, being looked at as a leader, considering her questioning yesterday in the Comey hearing, what more do you want to say? Yes, about indeed. That? She has uh, ascended so quickly and so fast on the national stage because she came across with such forcefulness when she, then the day before, she was talking mm -hmm. to the other gentleman, uh, Rosenstein, and he, uh, to asking him, will he sign a document saying that he will uh, guarantee independence of a special counsel? He wouldn't do it, but she held her ground. Yesterday, she was able to elicit, in seven minutes of talking with Comey, elicit something about information that Comey had and he can't talk about that sessions could be implicated first. Uh, with some Russian connection or something else. So she's able to bring out information without directly confronting, at the same time talking to Comey the right way to get that information. And she came across very, very poised as a strong person, as a strong senator who would not take any no for an answer. President Trump uh, tweeted this morning something to the effect that he was vindicated uh, through the hearing. You believe that, in fact, uh, former Director Comey has created an uphill battle for President Trump. Why? Yes, he has. I think the president's been set, set back a bit because Comey basically came out and said that Trump uh, lied about him and also defamed his character. It's not good to be called a liar by the FBI, former FBI chief. And uh, besides that, a lot of the public does not find Trump to be fully credible. His approval rating went down to 34 percent yesterday in the Quinnipiac poll, mm -hmm. which means from 40 percent now to 34 percent, the public is losing faith that he could be consistently believed, whereas Comey came across the other way. And it was Comey's testimony which actually brought that credibility factor down for Trump, unfortunately for him. He's got to build it back up and try to do so. How did Comey's testimony put Attorney General Jeff Sessions in a tight corner with how he conducted himself with Comey? Yeah, I would say that Jeff Sessions really was set back because, uh, first of all, uh, there's already now information that he may have actually not told the truth about uh, something besides the Russian meeting. But uh, besides that, when Comey brought up the fact that the president had cleared the room when they all met for the mm -hmm. counterterrorism meeting, there were many advisors there, including Sessions, and Comey had uh, been asked by the president to stay on and discuss something in private, and Comey was uncomfortable. He said, you know, he didn't really want to be there in private, and yet the president insisted, and Sessions also left the room, and then later on Comey brought that up, and Sessions just shrugged it off, basically, and said, you know, it's not a big deal. So he's lost credibility there, and Sessions is, is in for more grilling later on. Don't forget there was a private hearing yesterday as well, right, in the afternoon. Right. We don't know what was said there. And I think Sessions is in quite a bit of a, uh, maybe possibly in real trouble as we go along. We'll have to wait and see. You know, we can't jump to conclusions yet. Yeah, it is one, things. as many people have said, one piece of a huge puzzle. It's a huge puzzle. We'll, on, on, you know, we'll see come together over the next few months, uh, maybe even years. That's true. All right. That's very true. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for more information you. about the political analyst and professor Peter Matthews, check out his uh, website and follow him on social media. Thank you guys for being here. You've been here for a long time with us all day today. Uh, we saw uh, President Trump today um, being uh, sworn in as our next president. Peter, maybe uh, talk about, we also chatted that they will be sleeping in the White House tonight. And on that note, Peter, uh, we were talking, uh, tell us a little bit about, they slept somewhere near the White House last night. Tonight yes. they will be in the White House. Yes, they were in Blair House across the street, which is the president's guest house. Mm -hmm. Tonight right in the White House itself. And this is the, the real thing now. 
once you're in the White House, the whole world changes for you. Your outlook changes because now you're in charge of the most powerful country in the world. You've got a major economic reform that's needed right now. And he's been campaigning on getting more jobs. And this is going to be a real focus for him. And the first 100 days, by the way, is a honeymoon period. And that's when presidents have goodwill, usually from the other party itself. But, and this is a little exceptional. It's not quite that way yet. But still, in this case, Trump has to take the first 100 days initiative to get a lot of those things done, like infrastructure spending, job creation, trade. He said we're going to stop our jobs from being exported to other countries, cheap labor countries. Those are key priorities uh, for him. And he better capitalize on his first 100 days of whatever goodwill he has, which is not a whole lot, because don't forget, He's only got a 40% approval rating right now, yeah. which is the lowest of modern-day presidents. But I think he'll have his best shot right now to try to accomplish those things. Let's talk more about Trump now. Peter Matthews is a professor of political science at Cypress College. He joins us from Los Angeles. Good to have you with us. Let's go back to that speech, that inaugural speech. What did you make of it? Very unusual. Uh, most inaugural speeches have very high, lofty ideas that are quite general and appeal to everyone and talk about unity. But in this case, I think Trump's speech was... Uh, it dealt with ideas that were anchored in the dismal reality of the working middle class and the working poor who have lost a lot of uh, ground in the last 10 years or so, or even longer than that. And Trump appealed to them directly, and he had specific proposals about, and even, even characterized it as saying that Washington has forgotten the American people. The Washington elites and establishment have won, and the American people have lost, so to speak. So he actually used a populist, class-oriented, but mostly nationalism. He said, America first. He's going to rebuild the middle class in America. And this is something to be concerned about. I mean, it's certainly understandable why people responded to that. But I think the way to fix some of these problems around the world, or in our own country, is to have the middle class grow around the world. So he wants to also renegotiate, renegotiate NAFTA, for example. And I think the way he should do it is to encourage uh, higher wages in Mexico, higher environmental standards that would match more of the United States standards, and that way there'd be fair trade. But I think he's more of a protectionist. We've got to watch out for that. And same time, the inaugural speech was very unusual in that sense that he really focused on quite a bit of the negative that was going on in the country at this time, as he did during the campaign, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I thought it was quite a combative speech, saying that everything's broken in America and it needs fixing. I mean, especially when he had three former presidents sitting right behind him. Quite amazing, isn't it? Because those three presidents were in office during those years that he's claiming this thing mm. happened. But there really are a lot of people suffering. The question is, he should have focused a bit more on how to bring people together mm. to fix this problem rather than having it one group against the other. And I think that it's going to be a very interesting next four years, especially since he has a Republican Congress, some of whom don't agree with these ideas. That's very interesting. His own party, some of them don't agree with it. Others do. So you may have to bring on board some of the Democrats. And, you know, there's certainly a slight amount of Bernie Sanders message in this kind of speech that the middle class has lost out, the gap between rich and poor has grown considerably. And to fix the economy, to fix the middle class, to bring it back, you have to fix the, the give more money in the people's hands while working so they can go out and buy the products and have a better life in the middle class lifestyle. I mean, with all these big promises so to fix effective. people's lives, I mean, he's based his whole campaign on that. He won the presidency based on those promises. Can he actually deliver? Well, that only depends on if he's able to get Congress to work with him. And for that, you have to have a certain type of approach, and that is a, a consensus approach, a compromise approach, willing to work with other people and not think you can do it on your own because the president cannot do it on his own. Even Donald Trump can't do it on his own. He has to bring aboard a lot of the other members of Congress, of both parties, and to get the American people activated to, for a positive agenda in this sense. At the same time, not alienating some of the folks who were in power earlier. They, ha they have to be uh, brought along as well, if possible, but he's going to rely mostly on the working people, and he's got to bring the two parties together for this kind of change. I don't think he can do it on his own. Absolutely not. Peter Matthews, great to speak to you. Thanks for joining us there from Los Angeles. Well, Peter Matthews is a professor of political science at Cypress College in California and author of Dollar Democracy. Morning to you, Peter. Good morning. How are you doing, Claire? Very, very well. Now, listen, let's talk about uh, Theresa May going over as early as next month to visit. Uh, well, he will then be President Trump, won't he, of course? Um, how important That's is right. that relationship to him, do you think? How close is the relationship, did you say? Yeah, how important is it to him, his relationship oh, with the UK? It's extremely important. I mean, uh, Britain has always been considered uh, a very special relationship with the United States, starting with way back in our culture and our history, but also World War II. After World War II, in the security alliances, Britain was a leader with the U.S., with NATO, and not to mention uh, the Lend-Lease Act during the war. A lot of things are very special between Britain and the United States. So Mr. Trump would like to keep the special relationship, even though Ms., uh, Mrs. May had criticized him uh, early on during the election 
for wanting to ban Muslims outright from the country and the statements that he made about women. She has come, come aboard now and said, this man is president now. I want to work with him. And I, we get along well. She, yeah. she actually flattered him and she, she gets along well with him. Yeah, so so that should be a right is, is he on the front foot rather than her? I mean, you say, you know, that there has been a special relationship, but, but that's that's ancient history, isn't it? When you're talking about um, Donald Trump, he's, he's already criticised <laughs> NATO. Um, he's he's criticised a, a lot of the agencies that the US has been involved in and paid money into over the years to say, well, all yeah. bets are off now. This is a whole new era we're moving into. So does he hold the whip hand in this meeting? He does, actually, and that's a concern because we don't know which way he might go at any given moment. And we're hoping many of his advisors, or some of them, would be stable enough and experienced enough to rein him in and keep him in line in terms of what he needs to do to be a serious world leader and not to just, you know, say, make statements like about China recently, about meeting with, you know, having, having taken a phone call from the Taiwanese president, which, which create, caused a ruckus. So those kinds of things have to be really looked at carefully. Can he actually be the leader that the United States has been? And or will he just go off and do things that are so unpredictable that uh, we don't know what that will do for the British American relationship or for that matter, the EU relationship with Britain or the Russian relationship with the United States. Mm. It's a lot of things at stake here. And up now, a really fantastic guest host who's frequently on KPFK this day's Peter Matthews with special programming. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Peter Matthews on KPFK, the day after Christmas, the day that's supposed to be about compassion and justice and fairness, and sometimes it's been distorted a lot, hasn't it? Well, we'll get back to the original meaning of it by talking about these key issues. We'll be talking about LAUSD's ethnic studies requirement that was passed, a remarkable move compared to Arizona, which actually banned ethnic studies recently. And we're going to look at that and the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. Earthquake falls have been discovered under the plant recently. And not only that, but cancer rates, other kinds of disease rates have gone up in the studies that came out about Diablo Canyon. And we're going to interview Harvey Wasserman, author of Solartopia, Our Green-Powered Earth, and a leader in the movement to shut down Diablo Canyon. We'll also be dealing with money in politics issue and its influence of money on the 2015 federal budget, the giveaways to Wall Street and the super-rich, the waste and fraud in military spending, and we're going to look at that and look at how the military and the Pentagon have been misappropriating our funds, not even keeping track of it, so that soldiers' paychecks have been shortchanged. Boondoggle weapon systems like the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter have been had our money wasted on it. Unjust and unnecessary wars like the wars in Iraq and even today in Afghanistan. And cuts to education and social programs because of a bloated military budget. We'll look at all of that. And not only that, we're going to come on and talk about the increasing income and wealth gap between the rich and poor in America and the world and the disappearing middle class. And last but not least, we're going to look at social mobility in the United States having dropped behind that of the social democracies in Europe. In other words, for an American to be able to go from the working class or the working poor or middle class to the upper middle class and the upper class, that chance has been reduced now compared to in countries like Britain and Sweden and Denmark where it's actually gone up. The chance of higher social mobility is higher there than here, and it goes right to what we're doing wrong in politics and economics and money in politics in America. But we will look at every one of these problems, ladies and gentlemen, and find solutions. We're not going to just here be negative about things, but actually show how we can fix things in a positive way for this great country of ours. And last but not least, it's very important that we're going to have the lines open at 4.30 for the public to come in and tell us what you think about these issues and give us some of your solutions and ideas, because it's a two-way street, not just one way. And I would like to actually start with the more detailed assessment of the ethnic studies requirement. The Los Angeles Unified School District just passed a ruling recently that ethnic studies classes will be required for, as a re uh, graduation requirement for high schoolers in Los Angeles. And I think that's an excellent recommendation because, actually it's a requirement, because once we study the history and the economics of people of all ethnic groups in America that help make up this country, from Native Americans to African Americans to Latinos, and other groups, Asian Americans, then all of us can appreciate each other much better, not just tolerate, but actually appreciate the cultures and the backgrounds. And then we will be able to come together on political and economic justice and social justice. Issues like lack of education opportunity and tuition skyrocketing right now while students can't afford to graduate and to even go to school in many cases, and they're taking longer to graduate. Those issues will help. This will bring us together to solve those issues. Peter Matthews, is this going to be it, a protectionist 
zeitgeist, a recoiling of American power? I don't think so entirely. There'll, there'll be a movement in that direction, but we can't do that entirely. And the United <coughs> States is the one number, uh, it's a global power, the superpower still, uh, extension all over the world with military bases, with diplomacy. So I don't think Trump will be able to come up with an isolationist policy, but there'll be more balancing of focus on domestic policy and having other countries take their share of the burden in foreign affairs. At the same time, we'll still be engaged with the world. I think Trump is talking about more like fair trade, not free trade, but fair trade, where the terms of trade are more even. So he wants to renegotiate some of those trade agreements, like NAFTA, for example, and he doesn't, he's against TPP entirely. So it wasn't against trade or international involvement. It's a more balanced, nuanced way of doing it. Uh, now, it'll be interesting to see what Bernie Sanders' influence will be there as well, because Bernie Sanders had a tremendous groundswell of support against our job exports and outsourcing of our jobs, the gap between rich and poor. And you know, Trump is, is a right-wing populist, unlike Bernie Sanders, who's more of a progressive left-wing populist. But some of those ideas do come together in a sense. I just hope that Trump stays on, on message about uniting the country and not speaking about ethnic differences in a negative way or immigration bashing. I think if you could unite the country and come bring people together now in a new way of saying, this is a new era. Right? Well, staying on the subject, joining me now is Peter Matthews. He's a professor of political science at Cypress College and joins me from Los Angeles. Good to have you on the program. Pollsters have been seriously be battered and wrong globally uh, in the past 12 months. We saw the Canadian general election completely go in a different direction. Many pollsters in the United Kingdom thought that the British people would not vote to leave the European Union. So how seriously can we take the role of pollsters and the way that they are perhaps um, guessing who might win uh, the general election in the United States. Take it somewhat with a grain of salt, although we have to give pollsters some credit, but here's the reason pollsters have been off so far recently, is there are many, this is the winds of change time, and many people are upset at the status quo, and they're not normally regular voters. In the case of Brexit, many people voted for the first time, and they voted for Brexit when it wasn't predicted that they would do so. The same thing in the United States. Many voters that Trump is bringing in are new voters who don't get factored in the polls. So there could be a hidden vote there for who are dissatisfied voters, angry voters who have lost their jobs, who see no hope right now in the country. And yet Hillary Clinton has a tremendous chance to win because of the fact that she has a big machine with her. The ground game with the Democrats is superb. They have lots more money than Trump to pay people to go to the polls, to go door to door. I'm sorry, to go to go door to door to, to get people to the polls. They can have paid volunteers to do that. Uh, part of the democratic machinery. They have President, Clinton, President Obama, President Clinton. They have Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders campaigning for her all over the country. Mm. And Donald Trump is basically himself and uh, his vice presidential running mate and a few other people and lots of volunteers. So it's very unpredictable what would happen if Trump turns out voters that don't normally vote. And a lot of them are actually Democrats who've sure. lost jobs to outsourcing. So Hillary has to hold on to those people and look at the swing states. The swing states polling numbers have narrowed recently. In Florida, Hillary is winning by about 2%. In Pennsylvania, a very, very important state for Hillary, she's winning by 3%, but it was, she was up by 12% just a couple of weeks ago. In Michigan, it's down to a 4% margin of victory for Hillary, actually more than 3% right now after an 8% lead for a Peter, long time. Peter, sorry so to interrupt. Let me, just, let, let, me, let, me just, let me just come in there, Peter, sure, because sure. there's lots of things that you've hit on. Yes. And the thing is that, you know, you talk about these polls and, you know, up and down uh, as they have been uh, across the states. Much is being made yes. of early voting and people that have voted very early, but also much is being made of those that are yet undecided and will go to the polls on November the 8th. How important are that group of people and how large are they according to pollsters? The group that has not, who's not decided yet is between five and eight percent. And that is significant because it only takes a few of them in one state or two states such as Pennsylvania or Florida to switch sides and then the other side wins, the, the electoral votes, which are huge numbers in those two large states. So that number of undecided voters is very late in the game now, and they still haven't decided yet. But they will go in there and vote, and some of them may be voters who secretly favor one candidate, but don't say that to the pollsters. That's where the unpredictability comes. They're a very important group, actually. And both sides are trying to win them over by going all over the place right now in those states. Indeed, and and very heavily. Indeed, very few this, days. Yeah. Let they say a week is a long time in politics. I think four mm -hmm. days certainly will. For the moment, Peter Matthews, thank you. Yeah, and, and the Republicans and indeed the president-elect Donald Trump have all said that they would like to keep some aspects of Obamacare. Which aspects do you think they should keep and why? Well, I personally think they should keep all of them and then expand on them and make the, make the United States have a comprehensive universal system like 
all the other countries that are civilized in the world. Britain, for example, you have the NHS. You have uh, single-payer health care in Canada, Medicare for all. We need to have something like that over here. And I think that if they do keep some of those uh, portions of it, they must at least keep the part that says that no insurance company can kick you off the plan just because you have a pre-existing condition. And also that young people who are on the age, under the age of 26 can remain on their parents' insurance until they're 26 years old. These are all very incremental steps that Obama uh, took. And in my book, A Dollar Democracy, I say in the chapter on health care, I call Obamacare a small step in the right direction. It should have been expanded to a public option or a single-payer type of nonprofit medical insurance system as in Canada, Medicare for all, as we have here for the elderly. That would be the way to go, in my opinion. But seeing Republicans, the majority, and Donald Trump coming in as a Republican president, it's going to be very tough for anyone to get anything done in that direction. So more than likely, we'll start to see some cuts in Obamacare and some real revisions to it. Not entirely, though. Well, you mentioned the NHS here in the UK. I mean, we're very used to the idea of universal health care here. It seems like a no-brainer to us. Why has yeah. Obamacare been so controversial in the US? Because mainly of the lobbyists, the various wealthy uh, lobbying groups that donate money to campaigns to members of Congress to get elected with their money. And then they owe these lobbyists something. The health insurance industry lobbyists, the, uh, so it used to be the American Medical Association at one time used to be against it universal health care. There were lobbyists, lobbyists from the pharmaceutical companies, the drug companies, all these very special interest groups have been able to keep away a concept of universal health care and to vilify as being socialized medicine. Well, frankly, most of our allies have socialized medicine or some forms of it, as Canada does, and it works very well. Those countries like Britain and Canada have longer life expectancy than the United States people itself. We have shorter life expectancy. We have larger rates of infant mortality here in this country than in other countries. And we have uh, other kinds of problems that the outcomes of which are a result of not having universal health care. Even with Obamacare today being implemented, about 30 million Americans, 20 million Americans are left uncovered. And if, this, if the Republicans repeal the entire Obamacare, 20 million Americans who actually receive coverage will lose their coverage as well. So a total of 15 million Americans that should actually be covered fully are only partially covered now. And about 30 more million would lose their coverage entirely. And that's not good at all for anyone. It would make all of us, even those of us who have health care, even more in jeopardy of our health when people around us are not healthy. And it's just not a humane thing to do. So that's why I would urge President Donald Trump to go in the other direction and say, look, let's expand it, make it efficient, single-payer, non-profit health insurance, as in Canada, as we have for the elderly here, lower overhead costs, no deductibles, no co-payments, and people will go see the doctor more regularly and get preventive care and live longer. And that would be the way to go for America. Yeah, indeed. We'll have to wait and see exactly how long it takes and exactly what happens. For now, though, Peter Matthews, great to talk to you. Thank you for joining us here on Sky News. Let's talk to Peter Matthews. He was the Democratic Party's nominee for the U.S. Congress in 1998. And he's also the author of Dollar Democracy. He's joining us now live from Los Angeles. Thank you very much indeed for your time, sir. Alan was talking about the, the, the money men and the influence that they have in terms of the Republican Party. But this is also relevant to the D Democrats as well. Give us some indication of how you think the, the, the big money, as it were, for the remaining few weeks of this campaign is going to move in terms of both the Democrats and the Republicans? Yes, very interesting. There's a big difference in the two sides because on the Republican side, the candidates have to raise private money, big money, from corporate PACs and also from super PACs and donors. But on the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders, the candidate who's challenging Hillary still, has a tremendous base of donors of over 7 million donations, and he's raised hundreds of thousands of dollars already, at least over $100,000, and he still keeps getting the money coming in, so he can actually last a lot longer than Ted Cruz could, because Ted Cruz had a very devastating loss today, over double digits, and he uh, is dropped out, as you know. So I think it's different on the Democratic side, because Bernie Sanders has vowed to go all the way through the, through the conventions, all the way into the convention, and even take it to a floor fight, because his ideals are important for him and his followers. And Hillary has to bring those Bernie followers over if she can. Many of them are very skeptical because they, they believe in no money in politics. They want private small money, small donors like themselves, not the big corporate donors that Hillary has taken. This has to be worked out in mm. some way or the other. But it is a different Pe scene on the Democratic side than the Republican side. Yeah, but Peter, I wanted to ask, I mean, Sanders has made a significant impact on this campaign. 
not least because he was competing competing against Clinton, but also in many ways he seems to have been setting the agenda for many of the discussions that were going on uh, in, in during the campaign, and also the fact that he, if I understand correctly, he at one point in March raised 44 million dollars on his own. I think Clinton at the time only raised 21.9. I'm sure you're more across the figures than I am. Yes. Give me an indication. Those of figures the, are correct. Well, give me an indication where you think. Sanders is going to what role Sanders is going to play in the event that Clinton does make the presidency. Well, let's first backtrack a bit. Clinton has to still win 2,383 delegates, including her pledge delegates and super delegates, because by the pledge delegates alone, she's going to fall short of the 2,383. And Sanders, so will Sanders. So it looks like the key players are going to be the super delegates, and Sanders is going to make a very big pitch. The super delegates saying. I'm the stronger candidate. The polls are showing me ahead of Trump, far ahead of Trump, whereas Hillary is much closer. And I saw one poll where Hillary is actually tied with Trump right now. So Sanders is going to try his best to say we brought new people in. We can activate excitement among the Democrats which and the independents. I can even win Republican votes, Sanders will say, as he has in Vermont before. And he'll portray himself as a stronger candidate that can take on Trump and defeat him. And he'll say that Hillary has too many weaknesses. Of course, that's to be expected that he's going to say that. The question is, will the delegates buy it? Well, joining me now for more on the bill is Peter Matthews. He's a professor of political science at Cypress College in Los Angeles. Uh, professor, thank you very much for joining us. Now, uh, explain to us, what does this bill actually mean? Because the 9-11 Commission report back in 2004 found no evidence that the Saudi government as an institution or senior officials individually funded the organization. That's correct. It's called the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, or JASTA. It was passed unanimously by the U.S. Senate. And what the bill means is if it does become law is that American citizens can sue foreign governments that sponsor terrorism on their soil, on our soil. So it's a very serious bill because President Obama has threatened to veto the bill. He says it will complicate international law because if that can happen, then uh, it could happen in the opposite direction as well. That the U.S. government could get sued by foreign nationals who are victims of, uh, say, what you call collateral damage in a drone strike, for example, where they, the families, innocent families get killed by a military action of the U.S. So Obama is very loath, loath to have this pass, and yet the Senate's unanimous vote indicates that when the House gets it, it'll probably pass by a large number of votes, in which case the president's veto will, be, uh, will not be sustained. It'll actually be overridden, and it'll become law anyway. It's a very tricky situation right now. Very, a precarious one between U.S. and Saudi relationships. Let's talk about those relations. We're talking about uh, up to $750 billion in assets. Um, that could be potentially sold. Yes, that's what the Saudi government has threatened to do if this act becomes law. And that's a lot of money that the Saudis will unload, that they've lent the U.S. government, and it'll create a lot of uh, havoc with the markets and with uh, the fiscal policy. So we're looking at some serious ramifications if this bill does pass. Yet you can understand that many Congress members are very uh, concerned about voting against an act like this, which seems to have such popular support. It sounds like it's the victims of the 9-11 attacks that are do some justice. By the way, in 2005, the victims of the 9-11 families did take court action, and the judge ruled in a district court here in the United States that the Saudi government was not liable, that it was, in fact, not allowed to be a defendant. It's not going to be a defendant in the actual action because the act doesn't apply to it. It said, the judge said this action originated outside the United States, and therefore, the Saudi government was not culpable in any way or even be able to be sued by the, uh, the victims of the family. So that ruling in 2005 was the beginning, the, the first shot in this direction. Again, in 2015, when the court case came up again, a judge ruled in the opposite direction, saying that, yes, the victims' families can sue the, the Saudi government or any government that uh, sponsors terrorism, if it does. Let's get more on the story. We're joined by Peter Matthews, who's professor of political science and author of Dollar Democracy with Liberty and Justice for Some, joining us from Los Angeles in California. Peter. Many thanks for joining us, Peter. Uh, I believe some of these electoral uh, college voters have even received death threats. I mean, what are the chances that these electors will vote their own way and go against the mandate of the people in their state? I think the chances are quite small, actually. They'll need 37, 37 electors, Republican electors, to switch over to the Democratic side, Hillary, and for her to be able to win this over Trump. And I think only one, one Republican elector has come out publicly 
He's from Texas and said that he's not going to be supporting Trump. He's the only so-called faithless elector. But we've got to go back to history a little bit. Alexander Hamilton, one of the founders, in Federalist Paper Number 68, he set up the reason for the Electoral College. He said that in case the public chooses the wrong person out of misinformation or whatever, a passion, that a group of selected people, selected by the, the leaders of the country, would be able to actually vote for the presidency and make a much more reasoned judgment. Now, that's, that'll go down very hard with the Trump supporters if the electors switch over and vote for Hillary. Although Hillary won 3 million more votes, approximately 3 million more votes than Donald Trump, popular votes, the way the system is set up, the electoral votes are the only ones that count. And it's based on per state electoral count. So the smaller states, the rural states, actually have the numerical advantage because each state has two senators, for which there are two electors, in addition to House electors, and it doesn't matter what population the state has. So the states that are smaller in number have more numbers of electors in the Electoral College than their population would warrant. So it does have a small bias toward the rural states and smaller states where Donald Trump did very well, actually. It's, it's a very big conundrum right now, but I don't think it's going to be switching over and, and flipping to, uh, Donald, to Hillary Clinton. Uh, that's, that's my educated guess. You don't uh, know what could uh, happen. Okay, uh, but no. looking ahead, I mean, given we've seen this sort of discrepancy happen, do you think that we could see the entire system change? Because there have been calls for it to be scrapped. Oh, absolutely. In fact, it's happened twice. When Al Gore was not elected, uh, although he got more popular votes, and again this time, within 20, less than 20 years, it's happened twice. And there have been many calls to just abolish the Electoral College, and I believe that would be a good move, and I think that we may see some movement here. It will take a constitutional amendment, which means that uh, two-thirds of the House and the Senate have to vote for the amendment to propose it, and three-fourths of the states have to ratify it. That's the main way of doing it. So that's also a tough call, but a lot of popular pressure now. The majority of Americans actually want to abolish the Electoral College, about a little over 50% say they should abolish it and let the people decide. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. This is probably the only one election which brought the, this whole issue of the Electoral College uh, to the forefront, like no other election before. For tonight's Conversations with Great Minds, I'm joined by one of America's leading progressive voices, political scientist Peter Matthews. Currently a professor of political science at Cypress College, an adjunct professor of sociology at Long Beach City College, Peter is a political analyst and a radio talk show host in addition to being an academic. He's also seen how the political system works from the inside. In 1988, he was the Democratic nominee for Congress from the district surrounding Long Beach, California. Peter's new book, The Dollar Democracy with Liberty and Justice for Some, How to Reclaim the American Dream for All, is a must-read expose of how our government has been hijacked by big money. Peter Matthews, welcome. It's great to be here with you, Tom. How are you doing tonight? I'm well, and thank you for joining us from our Los Angeles studio. I'd like to start with you, Peter. You're a professor of political science, radio host, former congressional candidate, activist. What would you say is the guiding principle in everything you do, and how did you first get into politics or interested in politics? Well, you know, um, I was actually a psychology major in college, and when I went to Europe and I saw the Berlin Wall, that changed everything. So I crossed over to East Germany and talked to the people there and asked how they lived. And pretty soon I started to recognize there were a lot of walls around the world, you know, and the walls between rich and poor, between men and women, between uh, different ethnicities. And I, I, I took some classes in international relations and uh, uh, world politics when I got back to college that summer. And I said, this is the field I need to try to explore more. So I went ahead and double majored in psychology and political science to find out more about economic development, exploitation, neo-imperialism over the time, and imperialism itself. So. It was very interesting to me. I've traveled to 27 countries to actually find a way to reduce those walls and create more justice, Tom. Equal opportunity and equal justice for all is, to me, my, my basic uh, goal in life to help with that. You've, you've written a book called Dollar Democracy uh, with Liberty and Justice for Some. In fact, uh, there, here's the book. Uh, tell us about yes. the book. Why did you decide to write it? Well, I decided to write the book because I was noticing that many of my students were having increasingly difficult time making it through college. And it wasn't their fault whatsoever. In California, we had tuition-free education from the 1960s to the 1980s until the elites took it away by giving corporate tax loopholes to oil companies and other big businesses. And in, the, in turn, they took, went ahead and cut the subsidies for public education and universities and colleges and started raising the tuitions by several hundred percent. And my students couldn't make it. They had to drop out and go work full-time and go to school part-time. So their dream was being, their American dream was being delayed and in many cases completely taken away. 
and I thought this was totally unjust, not just in education, but in every single area of our lives, policy areas, in health care, in the environment, in our food supply, in the Wall Street crash, in every one of those areas, you see the hand of dollar democracy, Tom, where $6.2 billion was raised and spent in 2012 alone on federal candidates. This year it will even be more. And this started before super PACs. It started before Citizens United, when, when the biggest corporations bought both parties, including much of the Democratic Party, not all of it. We've got exceptions like Senator Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and other grassroots people like Senator Wellstone who refused corporate money and won the right way. But the majority of Democrats and almost all the Republicans have been bought at the federal and state level, and our middle class is suffering, and so is our country, and we cannot survive without a middle class. You know, Aristotle said that, Jefferson said it, we all know it. Yeah. So that's what happened. I wrote the book for that reason. Is, is that yeah. what you mean when you say dollar democracy, basically democracy that's been bought and paid for? It's been bought and paid for and through the areas of election financing as well as lobbying. Don't forget the lobbying part. In many cases, lobbying consumes even more money where these corporations take legislators on vacation, working vacations to Hawaii, for example. That was done with our California state legislators by the energy and pharmaceutical and oil companies for vacation in Maui to discuss issues such as oil taxes or the lack thereof. So these lobbyists have bought and paid in election campaigning as well as lobbying our Congress and our elected leaders from city council on up. And I believe the way to turn it around is to go through several things, public financing of elections as they have in Maine and Arizona.